Now, speaking of imagination, um, Benjamin, I'm going to turn this uh, over to you, and uh, just with a little introduction. Um, the city of Moscow, and I know you have something to do with it, is undergoing quite a bit of transformation, um, and it faced enormous criticism, sacrificing roads for pedestrian areas, um, why do we need such broad avenues in the northern city, etc. And it also requires certain imagination. Um, so why don't you talk to us about the city and artificial intelligence and how you plan to well, sh sure. transform I, I, it. I should say that the, the, the hello everyone, I'm Benjamin. Um, I should say that I'm the director of the education program at Strelka Institute, Strelka KB is the uh, urban design consultancy that has been primarily responsible for this, the My Street project and the reorganization of Moscow. And so I can take neither blame nor credit uh, for the, whether you like it or don't like it. I can comment on it, but not as, not as the author of it in, in, in any way whatsoever. But that said, the, um, this question as you raise of, of artificial intelligence at urban scale is becoming an increasingly important uh, research theme for the postgraduate uh, program at Strelka, which we called the called the new normal. Uh, we finished this first year. We're beginning the second and third year. I'm in the middle of a sp speaking tour to uh, 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 invite people to may want to participate as as uh, as, as as researchers in, in in this program. So, let with that said. Let me introduce a couple of the ways in which we are looking at AI at urban scale. The first thing is we're not interested in the traditional smart city perspective, which I see as a way of sort of taking the city as we think it exists and simply adding a little bit of uh, software to it to optimize it slightly. In fact, we take a rather a very different kind of perspective. Um, I would argue that really it's almost a geology of AI. And let me, what I'd like to do is to take the 10 minutes to sort of unpack that, that idea of a geology of AI. So when we, oftentimes when we think about artificial intelligence, we think about it in terms of some kind of computational intelligence that is so advanced it's human-like. Um, the Turing test, going to Alan Turing's uh, you know, sort of key essays of 1948 and 1950, laid out this idea and set it, sort of set it in stone. Now, if you're not familiar, the Turing test is, in a nutshell, that if a computer, if, you c if a person can interact with a computer and after doing so cannot tell whether or not they're interacting with another human or a computer, Turing then asks, is that not then a sufficient condition to say that the computer is, for all intents and purposes, intelligent? Sufficient condition. What's happened, however, is that that has become interpreted not as a sufficient condition of intelligence, but a necessary condition of intelligence. That is, unless the computer can fool you into thinking that it thinks the way that humans think that humans think, then it's not thinking. And we argue that, in fact, this is missing most of the interesting things going on with about what AI is about. You could think of it this way. Um, 1953 is roughly when we, ha we, we ha get a, a, a good uh, estimate of the age of the Earth. 1953, right? For the year that Waiting for Godot came out, uh, when we figured out. So, what Earth managed to do over this period of billions of years, 4.7 billion, billions of years, is to create a certain kind of matter, the frontal cortex of the human brain, to evolve this matter, fold this matter in such a way that the planet could figure out how old the planet was, which is an interesting thing for a planet to do. So we've had this few million years of animal intelligence. We arguably have had vegetal intelligence, and now we have something like mineral intelligence, which is what, why we see AI working. Now, 
we should assume that this mineral intelligence is, doesn't work the same way in which all the other different kinds do, that there's some things about it that will be different and some things about it that will be similar. Some of the things that will be s different is that, I I in a way, is that we, I guess we think of it this way. Um, instead of us teaching the machine what thinking is by making it think like the way we think that we think, it would demonstrate a much wider spectrum of what thinking is. And so the real philosophical lessons of AI are less about us teaching it what thinking is than uh, it teaching us what thinking, is, where, our kind, where our particular version of thinking sits in this wider spectrum. So what's similar would be that however it is able to think is closely connected with how it senses the world around it. Instead of thinking about AI as sort of AI in a petri dish or AI in a black box, we need to think about AI in the wild. AI as connected to how it's able to respond to photons and see, to light, to heat, to motion, how it's in, and how it incorporates that world around it is again inseparable for how it thinks, such that the sensing and thinking get mixed up. So in what we call evolutionary robotics, um, which is in a simple sense, artificial neural networks built into robots that learn things about the world in a more bottom-up way. Part of the reason this works so well is because how they learn to think to solve a problem is based upon how they have incorporated and been trained by the input that they've gotten from the world around them, what they've seen and interacted with and the data that they have been fed. The input, the sensing, and the thinking are bound together. So we're thinking about AI at an urban scale in these terms, in almost in evolutionary terms. We think of the, all of the sensory apparatuses that exist within a city that are sensing light and heat and motion and quantity and duration in ways that are very different than the way we do um, as a kind of distributed sensory apparatus that various AI may make use of. They may, one AI may be connected to those sensors, another AI may be connected to these, and so the evolutionary process um, works rather, um, works a little bit differently. So, um, two more points, and then I'll, I'll try to keep to my 10 minutes. Another point we want to, I, I think is important to think about in terms of the ethics of AI, and I know you're gonna speak a little bit about this as well, is, that the ethics that associated with any complex technology, um, we, can, we have to be careful not to assume that the, eth I guess, we have to be modest enough to think that the ethical application of the technology is not necessarily the, only the one that benefits us the most or benefits us the best. Arguably, what we call the Anthropocene, is not only the, a moment in which humans, and not all humans, but some very specific humans in particular, have transformed the earth in their, in, on, for their own benefit. It's also a moment of the transformation of the earth um, for the benefit of, 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 for the benefit of, of, of humans, for the benefit of humans' own interests. The Anthropocene, in a way, is the outcome of human-centered design in the extreme. Moving humans out of the center of the, our, uh, what we meet, our, our understanding of an ecological ethics uh, may be a prerequisite. And so the, how AI, uh, pl the role with this is also one of the things that we're, we're, we're researching. Um, I should say one thing about Mars then, since we're on, the, on this topic. Um, I, I go back and forth a bit on, what, on, on my degrees of, uh, opt of uh, uh, 
optimism or pessimism for the, the Mars projects. I think in the long run, though, the interest and initiative uh, around Mars are probably for the best. Uh, one of the, Le just uh, Lev Manovich is here, who's here in the front, is also one of our faculty at, at Stroka. Another one of our faculty at Stroka, um, Ben Cerveny, uh, was a project that he was, was, was working a project for SpaceX, uh, who's, as you know, doing a lot of work around Mars. And the project that he was looking at was uh, interface design for closed loop uh, biological systems. So you would have a Mars colony, all of the things that are grown get eaten, digested. The whole thing has to be a closed loop system, super energy efficient, super closed loop. And what their project was to design this, this model. What's of interest to me, I suppose, of this is that solving these kinds of G call them geoengineering problems, call them terraforming problems, call them geodesign problems, whatever you want to call them, about how it is that you develop, design, maintain, and organize um, uh, at an ecological scale. Anything that we could solve for Mars would be much easier to solve for, for Earth. And so Mars as a model for the kinds of uh, difficult choices and difficult design and engineering problems, political and political um, as well that we face over the next few years, is one in which um, the, non, the indirect benefits of this may be, uh, may be quite, uh, quite important for us. In terms of us going to Mars, um, I tend to think that we're, of all the Earthlings, most of the Earthlings that have been in space are not humans, right? They're dogs and cats and monkeys and bugs and other kinds of things. And of all the Earthlings, we're not a particularly one, we're not particularly well suited to uh, space travel. We're, we're kind of fragile. We need lots of oxygen and radiation shielding. And you think of the, you know, the astronaut doing the spacewalk, kind of this um, embryo with an umbilical cord coming out of them. Uh, it may very well be that the non-carbon based species that we're currently developing will be uh, the more successful uh, inhabitants. I mean, Mars already is a planet uh, inhabited entirely by robots today. Uh, and there's no reason to think that those early successes uh, aren't the direction that will scale more successfully than putting monkeys in a can and throwing them in the sky. Well, spe uh, Benjamin, yeah. speaking of monkeys, it's a little, uh, uh, in Moscow, in your place, there was, there was a woman, um, who, uh, whose topic was uh, extinction of uh, certain species. And her point was that uh, humans managed to kill or extinct um, two species of mammals every 100 years, and lately it has accelerated, okay? Yeah. Uh, now, the question to you is, the question to you is the following. And all this extinction, by the way, was driven by perfectly good reasons. Deforestation, uh, growth of uh, cities, growth of societies, etc. Since, and you don't have to answer it now, but it, it, in the second round, it's, it's my question, you can answer it in any way you want, but um, since people believe that in 100 years we'll live in continuous cities, there will be no countries, there will be amalgamation of uh, urban organizations. And you are making this world better, presumably, by infusing this with sensors, and the sensors will feel what we want better, they will interpret what we want better, they will serve us better. Um, do you think we're losing something in this process? Uh, something called privacy, something called, um, and what do you have a moral problem with it? Uh, do you think it will be something to escape from? And I think it, there will be a sect of people who would potentially not want to be totally censorized. Uh, all right, that, that you're, you're making our world more data intense, more interaction intense. Uh, what is your thinking whether you're making it better? What is your thinking about what we're losing in the process and would be an escape from your world and uh, would this be a choice, or actually, there will be no choice? No, no choice. 
That's okay. Um, let me let me try to clarify my, my position at least on this. Um, the world is already full of data. For, for what right? information is not it, it's not as, uh, as though there is a natural world and then information is somehow layered onto this synthetically like butter or something. The world is comprised of atoms and bits of things that are that uh, things with cells and without cells that produce and have complexity. Complexity in the world is itself information. Uh, it's how that we went from a, a planet of that was largely entropic to one that was have a vibrant ecologies. Um, the problem, and I think we all agree on this as a problem, is that the one of the, and I should also say, I think we discovered computation more than we invented computation. I think it's part of the process of the world. The problem is that the last, is that this period of the last few centuries as one in which you mentioned the vertebrate uh, extinction, is that it seems that there has been a, uh, a collapse of, uh, of, of uh, informational diversity within that world, of ecological, ecological diversity, cultural diversity, linguistic, and um, this as well. And so, arguably, what's happened is not an explosion of information, more information, that being more differentiation, more heterogeneity, more pattern, more distinction. It's actually less information. Strictly speaking, right? Things have actually become more monologic, not less monologic. So, um, what we're interested then is, I suppose, is like how it would, would be how it is that, assuming that we discovered computation in the mid early 20th century rather than inventing it, and since then we've built a few kind of dumb appliances that are sort of okay at harnessing it, but not nearly as good as a plant is at, at, at this process. How can we use synthetic computation or how can, we, you, how can we engage with the emergence of mineral-based intelligence, of AI, of algorithmic reason in such a way that it would introduce greater in degrees of diversity, informational heterogeneity across the chemical and biological and cultural and linguistic um, systems, of the, uh, systems of, the, of the world. I think this is kind of, this is the idea. Um, on the the question of cities, you mentioned this around the sort of the continuous city. I mean, I'm a, I mean towards this idea of the sort of the introduction towards a greater um, not entropy but negentropy, the opposite of entropy, right? Greater informational density. Um, in order for this to happen, there probably have to be ways in which we have stronger boundaries between subsystems on the on the earth, right? And so if everything I mean, it's basic osmosis. If everything is flowing into everything else, it's going to be increasingly entropic. I think what we're probably looking at are continuous, uh, continuous urban networks, but ones in which there may be stronger boundaries between urban networks and um, areas in which humans have a, a minimum of footprint. And so I'm, I, my position one is with strong urbanization and rewilding, um, and not much in between. I think it's the in-between stuff that gets us in trouble. Uh, and so it's not nature on the other, the other side of the wall, but rather uh, an ecology that's able to, to some extent recover. Um, and to some extent, we would hope that over the next thousand years that there would be, the vertebrate evolution would continue in, in, one, way, in one way or another. Um, as for escape, I don't, I, I suppose that means something different to, to different people. Um, the kinds of religious and theological narratives that you were talking around are, are also kind of escape, a, a sort of transcendental escape. Um, I, I want to say one thing about the art, art in relation to AI in this as well, if I, if I might. In this. Um, so I, I guess, you know, I teach in an arts department uh, at, at University of California, San Diego. That's my primary professorship. And I, uh, um, we happen to have a joint PhD program with the anthropogeny department, which is the scientific study of human origins, looking at how it is that roughly 60,000 years ago, at the beginning of the cognitive revolution, humans became capable of feats of abstract aesthetic figuration. And looking at what kinds of neurological changes enabled that or were enabled by that way or another. And so, one of the things we see is that this capacity for abstraction is in many ways inseparable from what we call uh, aesthetic, an aesthetic imaginary, 
and, and abstract. And abstraction, if you dig a little bit deeper into it, especially at the neuroscientific level, is, is related to what we call uh, epistemic multimodality, which is a fancy term for understanding an abstraction that describes one thing and sort of taking that out of that context and using it as a, as a model to describe a completely different context using that same, using that same, abstract, that same abstract model. Does that make sense? It's something that art is very good at. It's something that math is very good at. Um, it's something that AIs are very bad at. AIs tend to be really focused on very narrow applications of this as well, but um, as we begin to move towards more general AI that becomes capable of those, those forms of, of uh, transversal abstraction, um, I think we begin to see very interesting things. I think just making machines that make paintings is not so interesting. It's machines that are capable of, as you were saying, of these sort of feats of, of, of transversal abstraction that was when things really start to get interesting. And we will really learn from them in a particular sort of way. So I hope that has answered your question. Yeah. Thank you.